in bringing me on this uh, webinar. I also hear that nearly uh, people from 10 countries are joining us and I wanted to say uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to every one of them and wanted to welcome them. Well, it's great. We have a, a great audience, a diversified audience, a very diverse group of people, of course. And I want to bring you back um, a little bit to throughout this conversation to on your career. We'll talk about a variety of things. But what I'd really love to start off with, you know, let's just take a look um, around the world. I mean, it's uh, the 2020 was the beginning of a new decade. It got off to a very bumpy start. Uh, we're not clear yet. We don't really know the focus, the pathway. Hopefully, we're all definitely headed in the right direction. A lot of time, effort, energy, talent, money, um, finance, investment, everything been putting in to make sure that we get clear of this pandemic. That's definitely, I think, the big focus at the moment. But as you look at, you know, the beginning of this decade um, from, from your viewpoint, vantage point in Texas, give us a feel, you know, sort of where you find the state of the world right now. So I think, Etna, uh, the key question is, of course, the 2020 that we just uh, have gone through. Um, and that has been a very difficult year for everyone around the world. Now, my perspective is slightly different than normal pundit when it comes to um, economic and other issues are concerned. My feeling was that the world was on its way uh, to move forward in all aspects of our, our initiatives in, in terms of being successful as a country, as, a, as an individual, as a family. I felt that this whole issue of COVID-19 is almost akin to medically induced coma we have been put into, the whole world. The whole world has been taken and, and we have been put into this coma where, where somewhere along the line, we would hopefully come out and be back same or with very little uh, effect. Because even if you go through medically co induced coma, there are certain side effects. The challenge that was before to the world and the challenge which is now is how strong was your balance sheet then and how strong will be your balance sheet now post COVID. And I think countries like US and even North America and even Western Europe or even East and Southeast Asia like Japan, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, those countries balance sheets were good enough, strong enough and now with the US being in a very special position that we do not have to deal with the gold standard and we can print our dollars at literally no cost to us. Countries of the North America, Western hemisphere, especially Western uh, Europe, those first year countries would come out pretty quick and strong. I think the second tier countries would be Eastern Europe, South Central America, Middle East, South Central Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. They would probably be the second tier city countries which would take a while for them to really come out. Now there will be a third tier countries which have always suffered. And, and I would probably say with a bold face that that's because of their governance issues those countries will struggle and they have been struggling before. But I think I have a strong feeling that the world of first tier countries, they would probably IMF, World Bank and all of those, they would probably differ, mitigate debt for those countries and somehow they pull them up. So my feeling is that overall, when it comes to post COVID, there would be tremendous amount of initiative, which would be coming on from the first tier, second tier, and third tier countries, either working with each other to pull them out. So I think this is where we are probably going in. It's all the balance sheet. It is, and I mean, it's been, 
you know, at a time really too, where, as you said, you know, the ability to print dollars to also have that general sort of fiscal initiatives, um, you know, when we look at the developing countries and we certainly look at, you know, some of the development banks that are helping them, but all of this money someday is going to have to get paid back. I mean, and is there a danger, you know, that perhaps some of the, um, you know, struggling developing countries, and we have heard some figures earlier on, in the pandemic that the poor were getting poorer you know what's the danger on this because you know it's it's a very delicate time and it's one area you know that we really can't be going back we have to be going forward right and and naturally if you see the world pre-covid we were all very busy in taking care of our own issues us was getting on the path of getting isolated by design under the last administration. We wanted to isolate ourselves and wanted to make sure that uh, you know, we'll make America great again. <clears throat> but if you see the history of America and the Western Europe, and if you see the amount of dollars that go outflow to help the other countries, including funding IMF and World Bank, they all have done very well in their own ways, including USAID. I mean, I mean, $350 billion of American money goes from private sector to help the countries. Forget about the public sector. Public sector dollars are in billions. What I see now that this time, it wasn't really anyone's uh, fault. I think because of nature has intervened somehow in this whole global affairs, my gut feeling is that all the countries are gonna come to work with each other, some strong, some weak, some not so weak. And I think this time we will be able to lift them up because it's a human issue more than political. Well, I certainly hope so. And I think everybody else will be definitely hoping that that's going to happen. Let's um, take a look now at just politics in the US. You've had a big shift there in terms of what's going on, you know, and of course, everybody in the world is interested and you know, I'm watching and just now that we've, you know, we have you coming from Texas and of course, you know, you've lived there so many years too. Give us a feel in terms of, you know, where you see international relations shifting or moving in the coming years now that there's been a change in the administration. So let me, um, since uh, so many uh, good friends are joining us from outside US and uh, and I myself, I'm an immigrant that came into this country 40 plus years back. So I wanted to share with something which is not unique to America, which was what we saw post election or during the last election, presidential election, we all felt that, oh my goodness, you know, we have not seen this in America and the democracy is falling apart. Let me share with you and remind all of us that democracy is an experiment. It's an ongoing everyday work that we have to work through it. In America, it's a tapestry of the beautiful cultures, heritages, and we all come into this melting pot, we call it. Now, go back to the history and it is not going to shock you. And I have some notes here that I wanted to share with you. What happened in 2020 elections? The presidential election in 1800 ended up friendship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson that predated even revolution. It ended, they were having these problems because one won the election and another refused to accept, just like we observed uh, a couple of months back. When the presidential election resulted, or results were announced in 1828, Supporters of Andrew Jackson's actually stormed White House. And the sitting president, John Quincy Adams, had to escape from the White House from the back door. Now, this may be something very important, but I'm talking only 100 years back. In 1860, actually, James Buchanan refused to meet the newly elected president, Abraham Lincoln, until the inauguration day, week rather, or the day, in fact. Now, what we saw this time was President Trump refused to meet Biden and did not even attend. At least Buchanan was able to attend that. You know, so the recent history that we see these things happening is pretty shocking 
when it comes to democracy, one person, one vote, Jeffersonian uh, democracy, where one person votes for and, and, and has the right. This may be a unique thing for people who do not know the history of America, but Americans are used to it. And I think just the way we saw President Biden coming in and taking the oath of office and running the business of people, this is going to move on and this may happen again, but people to call, to call me and say, oh my goodness, is America you know, breaking apart? Well, the beauty of democracy is that this is how we learn and this is how we move forward. I mean, I'll give you an example. This is the 400 years of history in slavery when it comes to America. Every country in the Europe has gone through different notions of government, including fascism in, in France and everyone else. If you look at history of America in terms of democracy, because it has no rigidity and it is able to move one side to the left and that it's almost like a pendulum in the clock. You turn to the left, you bring it back. You come to the right, you bring it back. So American history is built on those fundamentals. So we are not going anywhere. So I think that's where America is. Now, if you see the economy of today, $1.9 trillion were just uh, approved by the Congress for these stimulus. Biden is asking, President Biden is asking for another $3 trillion for infrastructure. And then we have climate issue coming in. And I agree with you now that the, the, the dollars that we are borrowing for America, they are not expensive because the rate of interest at this point is zero or sometimes even in minus. So those are some of the valuable assets that we still have. Remember during Clinton time, Clinton time was one of the first president after a long time, he had balanced budget. So American economy is so huge that if you get a push towards a better economy, the growth of revenues coming to America in the treasury are so humongous because of the largeness, $25 trillion economy, the balance of budget can be done very quickly once we have moved forward for terms. So I would not be worried that much that people call and say America is falling apart, it ain't. Yeah, indeed, I do think you're right. We have to remember, you know, democracy is, is messy. And um, it's the good side and the bad side about it, but we have to take them both together Correct. because um, it is, I think everybody will agree, probably one of the, the better ways to, to live. And I think it's been proven time and time again. Yeah, but I mean, um, like I said, it's a I didn't part. really, you know, do a big, a long introduction to you in the beginning, because I wanted this to unfold, you know, as we go through. And of course, part of what you've just led us into there is, you know, the fact you're also a bit of a, historian so it's great we get that knowledge from you too but let me bring you back to sort of those early days in Pakistan when you were a young man what were your hopes and dreams back in the day give us a feel for you know where you were then and what you were hoping for well I come from a a very humble background um parents and seeing the first slide that Anjum showed where where there's an image of our family and uh, if you see that image i am the youngest of the nine siblings so when it comes to uh, weakness i was always there were always you know siblings who would harness me if they would see some talent in me there were siblings who could cultivate those talents and when they see in me something uh, which is uh, strong, uh, they would always empower me. So I always say that I'm one of the luckiest kid on this block because I had nine siblings set of three, three, and three. And then in the same image, if you see uh, my family as a unit, uh, my wife and, and our two kids, uh, 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 this image that you are seeing, uh, the, the image on the on the on the top left, you see Rabia, uh, myself, Ali, and and Muntaz. You know, I mean, as a person, even if you are a father or a son, 
As a son, I used to learn from my siblings and my parents. And even as a father, my daughter Rabia taught me from very big name when she was very young coming from the school saying that she learned from the school that it says that always before time and sometimes on time. I mean, that discipline I have tried to maintain even today. Uh, my son, one day we were sitting and we were talking about history and I said, this has been such a wrong way of saying things. And he says, dad, you have to remember that winners, my son Ali is telling me, winners write the history, not the losers. So if you want to be on the side of the, of the history, then you need to win. If you lose, then you do not get those rights. Those rights are abdicated. And then, you know, I have a wife. She's like a rock for the family, keeping us together. I mean, she is a back-end super person who can maintain everything and keep the family together. I mean, this is almost like a column that you can lean on. With that kind of support system from wife, kids, and, and other families, I think I was nurtured as a, as a person that I can be thankful. And then, of course, as far as my faith is concerned, I come from what they call a Sufi household, a mystical household, where it, it, it relies more on relationship than, than rituals. So all of those elements and attributes, I mean, I can be eternally thankful um, in my life to be able to be in a position that I was nurtured so well between wife, kids, and other siblings, and friends and families. Oh my goodness, I cannot be more thankful. Well, clearly you were, you know, you were very open and you wanted to learn a lot all the time. You're learning from your you know, siblings, obviously through school, get us up to a point where you go to university and, you know, your chosen topics at that point, And then where did you go from there? So my father basically, you know, inculcated me um, business from day one. He would have a photographic uh, studio. And when he would go for lunch, I will, uh, you know, run, try to run the shop. And if the clients would come, I'll say, my father would be back in one hour. And I didn't want them to leave. So I would keep talking to them. I would keep entertaining them. I will send the help to tell my father to come quickly back because we are otherwise going to lose. So that entrepreneurial spirit in me and trying to market, maintain the brand was probably instituted in me from day one. And I think that at the later age, uh, came out to be extremely helpful to me because naturally I was able to do, apply what I learned at the early stage into the later life. And you know, learning is a lifelong process. I mean, even, even today, when I'm reading something, I'll go back to the thesaurus and see if there was a substitute word for it. You know, instead of saying the word, oh, I want to tell you something, I learned to say, I want to articulate. Um, you know, so there are words that you still, I still learn. So lifelong learning from day one to day end is probably one of the key things that I think every one of us should try and live on every day. And of course, I ended up doing my master's in Islamic history from the University of Karachi, Pakistan. And that gave me a very handsome civic uh, knowledge about history in the world. And father was pushing me into, into the business element. So I think it came out as a holistic uh, package for me where I could, I could live a life uh, which, would be, which would be kind of a, a, a balance between faith uh, and between entrepreneurship and between the culture and the heritage that I learned through through history, my, my education. So, I mean, you've had many successful businesses, but talk to us a little bit, and I know our audience will be really eager to hear about this too, about your journey, you know, into the, the diplomatic sphere in terms of how that all started. We're very oh, interested in that. That is serendipity because uh, I used to have a photo lab in, in Austin, Texas, and it was probably a uh, couple of miles from the from the uh, from the uh, state building where the governor uh, office would be there, and uh, 
And uh, what a couple of times I had the first lady coming and bringing her films for processing. And then the, later on, I was introduced to the sitting governor uh, and who then went to become the secretary of energy under, under Trump. And, and he would bring their films for processing. So this is how I would process their film and build my relationship, which I learned my father would go for lunch and leave me the story and says, you know, my job was to hold the clients. It's called client retention. If you go to Harvard today to learn your MBA, it, this is what it is, how to retain the clients. So you be nice to them. You want to upsell them and all of that. I'd like to share with you something that I heard. Ross Perot, the Texas billionaire who passed away recently and who ran for presidential election. He said one time that he was invited to speak to Harvard MBA class. And he went to address the Harvard MBA class and said to them, he said, kids, I know you are here to get a degree from Harvard to do your MBA, but let me tell you something. The only thing they teach you here is to say things differently. He said, what you say, scanning the environment, I say, looking out the window. <laughs> So, so the basic tenets of, of, of being an entrepreneur or being a diplomat and, and all of those are same. You know, how do you are uh, able to communicate? And in, in many ways, you know, uh, I always tell the younger crowd that comes to me for mentorship and I tell them, I said, you know what? The beauty of a person's success is really simple. We need to learn to speak in measured tones. We need to make sure our vocabulary is, is clear and clean and whatever is in our mind, we need to have a word ready to speak. And I said, you need to be eloquent. And I said, one of the reasons Barack Obama became the president of the United States was because he did not come out as an angry black man. You need to give him full credit for that. He spoke in measured tones. He spoke sensible. His vocabulary was very strong and he was very eloquent in what he says and how he said. When he spoke, you understood very clearly. And these are some of the things that I have been learning every single day. Every single day I have to teach myself because this is how it's gonna take you uh, you know, a step, two steps further up. Now life is, you know, not certain. Life is not perfect. So we get two steps forward and one step backward, but overall we are moving forward. And I think those elements are very, very important in life. Talk to me, just let me continue this a little bit too, um, just in terms of the, you know, the power of communication and the power of strong, you know, communication skills. Clearly this is something that you're very passionate about. So, Anthony, I was uh, doing some background search on you, and you recently came up with four words elements. I want you to share that with the audience, and I will elaborate on that. Go ahead, and I want you to say that. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I think we, we share that passion, we share that love, and as I say to one of the key things, I think we all want to do at all times is, I said, we wanna own the space. Correct. You know, when you are talking, you're certainly owning it. I mean, I hope we're giving great value to all of our viewers here between the two of us that we own the space here. And you know, all the great work that uh, Amjun has done with the Alhambra uh, Chamber, all of that, this is about, we're presenting this for you. And I say, there's really only four things that we all need to do. It's quite simple, you can just break it down. And we all have a responsibility, I think, when it comes to communication is we need to engage, inform, we need to educate, and we need to inspire. So I think if you can bring those four elements together, you own the space. So now I'm really interested to see how you're going to elaborate on this for me. So owning the space, I always advise, especially to the young people, I said, you should be able to walk into a room and be an authority 
on a couple of subject matters, which I say you need to have what I call one inch wide and mile deep when it comes to authority on a subject matter. I said, take a couple of your passionate you know, subject matters. And I have been, if, you, if I can move this uh, laptop and take you on the other side of the office, you should see how many books I have been reading on race and slavery in America. Etna, it's a 400 years old original sin that we Americans do not know how to fix it. We have failed completely. Now, can I say a few things about it? Yes. If America can go post Second World War with a Marshall Plan to Europe with $50 billion and built it, can't we do something for our own people? But we are not prepared to do it because race is a very deep issue here. So, so I tell people, I said, when you walk into the room, you should be an authority on a couple of those subject matters where people, you should stop in their tracks when you speak in that room. I said, that's where you will own the agenda. Take a couple of those. Now for other purpose of conversation, what I say is, mild wide, wild and inch deep, where you would not have depth of information, knowledge or skills to come, but you will have been able to have a, a successful conversation where people will see certain value in you to be around you. And I think that's what you were saying. You own the space, you own the agenda. And I tell young people, I said, it's very easy really to do that if you, if you formulate. Now, if you have inch wide and mile deep and mile wide and inch deep, you know, you, you, whatever you call it, you have that depth of knowledge and you are able to articulate, you are able to pronounce, you are able to share your feelings in measured tones and proper vocabulary. Ethna, who would not want you to be a representative at any level? It may be diplomatic affairs or business or success. Any success, in fact, success will attract you if you, if you package yourself in that manner. And I think that's what you were saying in, in, in your attribu in attributes. That's exactly what your point is. Yes, I think it is. It's so true. And again, it doesn't matter about your educational qualifications. It doesn't matter about your, you know, beginnings. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter, you know, what gender you are, what race. It really is. If you can connect with people and um, you can, you know, make people feel, feel welcome and really help them to come into that space. It yeah. is, you will always find it so important. But clearly mm -hmm. this is something too, you did so well you know, in your thing, diplomatic career. But um, talk to history. me again, just a little bit about that and your appointments and who you met, because it's very exciting. So, so to continue and then moving into what you were asking me, look at leadership, right? Look at American history again. President Washington, the first president, he was offered lifelong presidency. He could be a monarch, he could be your majesty in America because we had a model in British at that time. He refused and he said, no, I'm not gonna run for the election. I want democracy to prosper. People like him go into history. Now we have what, 46, 47 presidents so far, but I'll share with you four presidents. Number one, him, Washington. We remember him in the history for what he did because he wanted to think for Americans and for the nation. He was not pushing his ideology that we do now. Look at uh, Abraham Lincoln. Came in from a very humble background from Chicago, Illinois, became the president and gave America, he abolished slavery. Look at the history. He was bold enough to go in and still won the second term. Then post First World War, FDR, what did he do? American economy is based on core capitalism, but yet he saw 
that people were suffering. There was a group of people, a cluster of people that were suffering post Second World War depression. He was bold enough to give us social security. He was, he was bold enough to give us Medicare, Medicaid, all of those, because it almost pulled a level of people from bottom up to a level where we had social safety net. This guy went into history, although you know, people still don't like him for what he did, but then capitalism is to a limit, but there is always a segment of people that need to be lifted. And FDR was bold enough to do that. Then as recent as, as President Johnson from Texas, what did he do in, in, in mid sixties, in 66 or 64, I think. He gave us the reforms where the African-Americans became equal in terms of everyone else as recent as what, 70, 60 years back in 60s. If you really want to be a person to be remembered, you have to make some bold initiatives. You have to do something for the country, for the family, for the state, and for, for your culture and heritage. You have to be something to be remembered. Otherwise, you'll be just one of those 46 presidents. And I think that's very important. And I tell everyone, I said, just 70 years back in America, Republican Party and the Democratic Party had liberals and conservatives. After, you know, Newt Gingrich came as a, as a leader of the House, completely destroyed. Now we are completely conservative to the right and liberals to the left. There was a time in the 80s when Reagan and Tip O'Neill would have lunch every Friday. Tip O'Neill was a Democrat leader of the House and Reagan was president of our country from the Republican side. Now think about it. They were having lunch every Friday because they were working for the nation, just like those four presidents or others. Can you imagine Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump having lunch now? It would be an interesting lunch for sure. We'd all exactly. like to be eavesdropping on that one. Yeah. But, now, um, what happens is when, the, when there is this kind of separation between left and right, in the middle, there's a, there's a black hole. And then special interest, lobbying, dollars flow in. The whole system gets corrupted. And that's where America is today. You know, that's why we're having, we don't know how to deal with China being the largest economy in the world, we have no clue because every time we have to make a statement to satisfy our own base, which is ideologies. And I tell you a story again. I was visiting a, a country when I was, uh, I was a US ambassador and I met the foreign minister who has been serving that country for 20 years as foreign minister. And the media was standing in front of us and taking notes and everything else. And he asked me, he said, as a Muslim, why did you accept this position? You should have not accepted this position because US is anti-Islam and anti-Muslim world. You should have not done it. And I said to him, I said, your excellency, would you want somebody else to explain to the president in the Oval Office and the National Security Council, what are the issues with Islam and Muslim world? Who would be better person, a Muslim or a non-Muslim? And then I looked at him and I said, your excellency, what you are asking me is what is said in common English language as application of common sense. And after the meeting actually, when the media went out, he took me on the side and our, our ambassador in that country was present. He took me on the side and he said, brother, what can I tell you? I had to ask you this question to satisfy the media. That's how politics runs. It's how it goes. But talk to us a little bit more specifically about that. When we look at the organization of Islamic cooperation, just tell me, and for some of our members who maybe are not very familiar with the great work that has been done over the years with this and the work that you, of course, you know, were doing in it as well in your role when you took over being the ambassador. Talk to us a little bit about that. So like United Nations, 
which has 190 plus uh, members. The second largest intergovernment organization is OIC with 57 members. And then the third largest is the Commonwealth countries, which is I think 42 or 43 members. So these are the three largest intergovernment organizations that are out there. Of course, United Nations is, has the largest budget and the OIC is situated in, in, is in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Um, I have visited the office and, uh, and the purpose of this whole body is to, to make sure that the Muslim country's voice is heard through a institution that can be represented. So America, Russia, Canada, Britain, those are, although the charter of the OIC says that a country has to have 30% or more Muslim population to join. Since these countries do not have it, then they have given them observer status. So US, I was representing as an observer status at the OIC, just like OIC represents as an observer status at the United Nations. So, so this is how they coordinate and work with each other on the, on the consistent level to bring security, peace in, in the world. And I think my role as the US being the major, is supreme you know, power in the world, of course, it, it, it played a very important role. And, uh, and it, it, the more I spend time in, in, in this, in this uh, environment, the more I realize that both the receiving party, the host country, and uh, the country that I represent with the United States, I felt that I was able to understand and come back and go to the Oval Office and talk to the president and, and, and make, sure that, make sure that things work in the, in the way that needs to be worked to create an environment where we have peace and security. Ethna, the problem post 9-11, which where I got appointed was that there was so much noise in the background from the political and other special interest in America against Islam and Muslims. It was such a huge noise that nothing could get through to really bring the message of peace and prosperity in the world through even my work. So it was almost to a point where, where some of the areas where I had to go and bring the Muslim leaders because they were completely misunderstanding where America stands. President Bush, the first week after 9-11, he went to the mosque in Washington and said, you know, that we are not in war with Islam. But that does not carry any weight because he said what he said. But then media, especially the media on the left and the right, was so harsh on, on Islam and Muslims. So we had to arrange uh, meetings in such a way that we had to bring the leadership of Muslim world to listen and hear from the horse's mouth in the White House at the State Department and the, 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 the National Security Council so they can assure them in their presence that America is really wants to work with Muslim and Islam. So that role, I think, um, I hope that I played very successfully. And then, of course, there were issues within the Muslim communities around the world. We had so much governance issue. I mean, I, I always say that, you know, 70% of all the natural resources that God has endowed on this earth, 70% of them are controlled by Muslims, countries. And yet the total export of the Muslim countries is less than trillion dollars mm -hmm. because we have not been managing our resources well. And I would say that to the Muslim world and the leadership. I said, we need, you need to work on it. I mean, can you imagine cocoa that you make chocolate out of it? Majority of them is produced from the Muslim world yet not a single Muslim country can come up with a good brand of chocolate like, like Switzerland or Belgium. We, we sell them at, at pennies 
cocoa and buy a $3,000, 3,000% profit to buy the chocolate back. This is where the issues are with the Muslim world. I mean, one trillion of export is nothing. In America, we pay $3 trillion a year to our treasury department is Texas. Now look at Americans. There was a, there was a, a story that I read that when it comes to voluntary going and pay your taxes, countries, America was at the highest, 85%. 85% of people in America at the end of April 15, which if you pay the tax day, they will voluntarily pay the taxes, the highest level. Now, you must be getting something in return for that, right? I mean, a citizen is getting something in return, which he feels or she feels is of value. That's only you pay the taxes. Although you see how otherwise we have been wasting our dollars in going in occupation and everything else that we do, it's because the economy is so big so we can sustain it. And those are the dialogues that I will have with the Muslim countries and they bring these issues back into the, into the Oval Office and at the seventh floor with the Secretary Condoleezza Rice. And I think that was very helpful because I was Muslim. I was from South Asia. I understood the issues and I could come back and articulate those issues. So important, yes. We have only about 15 minutes left, not even that. So I'm going to race through a few questions. So um, I'm loving your stories and I'm sure our audience is definitely loving it too, but I might have to ask you to edit a few answers now because I want to get through some of these. Just carrying on um, from that too, and the question that was in there really from James Watkins, when we look at the Middle East at the moment and we look at you know more friendly terms with Israel for many of the countries here, um, is there a kind of a difference of view now with the OIC members following the conclusion of the uh, Abraham Accords? I think Abraham Accord is, is in the right direction for the peace and prosperity of not just Middle East, but also the rest of the world. America is having a huge challenge um, in, in, in dealing, dealing with the rest of the world because we are putting so many resources in the Middle East. Now, in the Middle East, by the way, there are countries which do not want America to leave Middle East. They want to be, us to be engaged. And it is not benefiting America at all, I would say. Having so many resources put into, American resources to put into Middle East is not benefiting us. On the other side, look at what is happening with China. China just yesterday signed a $600 billion, 25 year deal with Iran. Just two days back, the foreign minister was there, right? Our resources, American resources should be moving towards East Asia, not Middle East. But then there are countries in the Middle East who would not want to leave, ask America to leave because they benefit hugely. And they have tremendous influence within the Congress itself and other segments of America. So, so it's not gonna be very easy for America to leave Middle East and say, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, you manage your own issues. We are gonna concentrate on our own issues that we have, internal and external. My feeling about this whole thing is that it was a huge mistake for America to come out of the Iran nuclear deal. It was a huge mistake because if you see today Middle East, Ethna, Iran was the only country who was able to move away from monarchy mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and, and the rule of law being applied by one person. The world is changing now. Things have to move. You know, America is still today, literally, and we are getting paid for it, by the way, so I'm not being naive here. Mm -hmm. We are giving protection to the Middle Eastern leadership just to protect themselves and their families to just be there and milk the resources of those countries. And they are still looking at these citizens 
still today as subjects. Can you believe that? We are living in 2021 and America is forced to give them protection for the dollars that we receive. Iran is becoming a country which is, which is sovereign. It is going to stand on its own. If America is looking and asking Iran and, and, and by sanctions thinking that it's going to subjugate itself, it's not. And I think America needs to look very deeply in this matter and make a decision which would be good for the Middle East and good for America. Yes, indeed, and I think it is. It's, it's so important that America you know, is, is there and is at the table. And I think, you know, hopefully um, we will see things heading in the right direction, you know, as we look, you know, towards Iran and we look and see what's going on there in years to come. I have a few questions here. So very quickly, let me run through a few of them. And unfortunately, I do need maybe shorter answers from you on this one. Um, from Luca uh, Venegoni, uh, looking at the rise in an anti-Muslim sentiment, do you think, you know, has that got better? Has that got worse? We look at, you know, race, the problem that it is in America, but we look around the world, you know, is that dialogue opening up? Are more people contributing to it? Is it, is it getting better? Now, you know, we always talk about democracy, where it's one person, one vote, Jeffersonian way of doing it. And we always felt that the beauty of America is that we have built these institutions for so many years that one person cannot derail or rattle uh, the political nature of our country. But yes, we have presidential system of government. So president has this, this, this uh, puppet where he can stand and make these comments. Unfortunately, last four years, to bait the base of Donald Trump for him, it was very important for him to keep bashing Islam and Muslims because his base was based on, his base was two important elements, Christian evangelist and white supremacists. This was his base that he, he you know, really built his, his, his political base on. And I tell you what, I'm making the statement which can be a little provocative, but, but this was Donald Trump's election was the direct result of America electing President Obama, a black person, because that was not forgotten. And, and that gave Trump a lot of strong base. And he kept batting, you know, he kept, he kept, kept talking about it, but hopefully now that he's gone and hopefully we have Biden, which is more sensible, I hope that this kind of not just diminishes, but at the same time, it comes down where things for anti-Muslim or anti-Islam bashing would probably, you know, if not slow down, at least settle down where we will have some positive statements coming from the new administration. Yeah, there's a lot of healing, I think, that definitely needs to be done and, yeah. and to move that in another direction. Another area, a question from Victor Sabalos here, talking about one other area that America has kind of come out of and needs to get back on track, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. How important are you seeing the environment and climate change? Is that moving to a higher agenda in the US? I know the government's certainly looking to do more on it, but are you feeling it among people as well? So here is my take on it. There are three um, areas. One is COVID, post COVID-19, that President Biden has to spend a lot of time and effort. Number two, of course, is uh, uh, climate change. And, and so, and number three is infrastructure. For all of those three elements, we need multi-trillion dollars. Now, we already have gone to about $6 trillion in the, between Donald Trump and Biden for stimulus budget for COVID. Biden wants another $3 trillion for infrastructure. 
If we can go for another couple of bill, trillion dollars for climate change, which is extremely important, not for US, but for the rest of the world, because you just saw what happened in Texas. I mean, look at, our grid was never designed to fix our problems. We have 100 degrees temperature, so the grid was designed to cool us. When it becomes 18 degrees, our grid was not designed to really warm us up. So we had a catastrophe here. So climate change issue is real and it's happening every day for you and me both. Forget about nations and my only issue is that with that kind of initiatives, where you have trillions of dollars coming into the economy to fix all of those on one side, we can have a runaway inflation that can be hugely problematic for the world and America with that kind of debt. On the other side, we have two years for Biden to really make sure that the House and the Senate remains with the Democratic Party. In two years, we will have midterm elections. And if the House is not remain, does not remain with the Democratic Party, we are looking for a lot of problems for America. Yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done in the next few years. We don't have, we're really coming to close to the end of this, but a few questions that have come in is one, um, I think that you'll be able to, we'll bring them all together asking you about, you know, the sort of almost the secrets of success. What do you need to do um, possibly more in terms of, I think, personal resilience and that to, you know, make sure you people have a successful career. We have quite a varied audience here and we have some younger people, you know, about to start their career and all of that. So a few words of advice in terms of, and then even to those of us who are established, we can all change, we can all pivot. What do you think are the key elements for success? So maybe I'll tell you two examples, anecdotes. And I have a way of engaging myself into sharing narratives, which you want me to be short. So I'll give you two examples. One is the fact that never give up. My, my senior research person always tells me not to repeat the story because he cannot validate it, but I'm gonna repeat it. Seven Up, the brand of soda, it says that the gentleman was at 67 years of age when he finally came with success of 7up. And the reason he named it 7up was because the last 67 years he had done six more ventures and he failed, but he never gave up. So the final one that he got was 7up was the seventh initiative that he did and he finally had success. So never give up. Number one, whatever age you are, it doesn't matter if you're a young person or you're a mature person. That's number one. Number two, you always have to think how this deal that you are engaging is, is successful for both parties. It has to be successful. It has to be a win-win. As, as soon as you start thinking what is for me in there alone, I doubt you're gonna make it because it has to be win-win for both. It doesn't matter if you're negotiating or if you're purchasing or if you're selling. So I think two of those elements you have to keep in life, never give up and be fair. And a final question from me before I hand back to Anjum. Um, just again, when we look at here we are, we still have a good shot at uh, the twenties. You know, Here we are, we start 2020. Okay, there's a a bit of a challenge to get through the opening years, but to get through the next decade, what do you really think the world needs to be really focusing on? And I suppose, what can we all do to make a bit of a difference? So the focus would be post COVID-19, it's built and built better because the economy is gonna change. It was just, as I said, it was a matter of balance sheet the demand and supply was there before COVID and will be there before COVID. There would be a few changes. People, some of them would be working from home instead of ever going back to the office. Those changes are not deal breakers. In actuality, they are deal makers. 
So I think post COVID-19, your mind and my mind should be only one sentence. We need to build and we need to build better. It's so true because anywhere we were, I think we all know ourselves how we can make things better. And I think we've learned during this time how resilient we all are. And um, you know, we've been almost forced to, to just take action and to do it. And I hear this from companies, from corporations, from governments, you know, sometimes we sit around and we overthink things. So it's about now doing them better. Um, I mean, Ambassador uh, Cumber, from my part, I'm gonna close it off. I'm gonna hand you back to, to Anjum and maybe you can leave a few more words with her. But um, I certainly wanna thank you from me. Um, you've definitely engaged, informed, educated and inspired us all. So it's been an absolute delight to have you. So a huge thanks to you. Thank you, Edna. Thank you again, Edna. And thank you, Ambassador Kamba, for always sharing your wisdom and experience. It's been inspiring. I have a few young adults here who wanted to thank you personally. And I will uh, turn this to Seth Johnson for a minute so sh she can summarize what they all have to say. So Seth, you want to take over? Sure. Um, Ambassador Cumber, I'd like to personally thank you for taking the initiative to create a space where people from all over the world can connect, exchange ideas, and learn from one another. Um, the impactful initiatives that I've been a part of at the Chamber and the internship program specifically has given me so much greater clarity and purpose in my life. And I've found the Chamber to be one of the safest places that I've ever been in to explore interests, to challenge myself and to gain new skills. Uh, so your leadership drive and vision for this organization has positively impacted so many lives. And I'm just one testimony of that. Thank you so much for helping make all of this possible. Well, thank you very much. And I think Anjum is one of those stars that wherever she is, she shines. <laughs> You, you are too kind. Thank you everybody for attending. We are going to uh, share the slides again with you. So those of you who want to stay on and take a look, please go, go ahead. Thank you again for joining us. We had people from 11 countries, oh sorry, 13 countries here. And uh, Ambassador Cumber, once again, sincere thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. And it was a real delight for me to be joining you too. And we'll keep in touch. And I look forward to doing some more on the Alhamra Chamber series. It's always a delight. Absolutely. And some great pictures here. That's what I'm saying, um, Ambassador Cumber. All of these dignitaries are keeping great company, obviously, with you. Well, we always learn and we always share. Uh, there are a lot of stories behind every image here. <laughs> So we'll have to find, we'll, we might have to do a part two. We'll have to catch up with you. And of course, hopefully when we all get to travel again, we'll all get to meet in person, which would be an absolute delight. Well, thank you. And I look forward to that. You know. Once again, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thank you for attending. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.